Grace Church. Y'all can have a seat. I'm going to take a seat too for now, so this is nice. All right, my name is Colin Dollar. I get to serve as the student college director here at Grace Church. If you are a guest with us today, hope you got one of these Connect cards right here. We'll have an offering basket right here in just a moment, um, and you can put the Connect card in there, or you can hand it to our Connect team after the service, or you can find me. Uh, I would love to talk with you some and tell you a little bit about our church. Uh, if this is your first Sunday here with us, we hope that you see a church that loves the Lord Jesus, uh, and we want to do three things really well. That's teach God's word, that's invest in you, and that's mobilize God's people to fulfill the great commission for his glory among the nations. Uh, we want to be a sending church composed of missional believers, and so that's why we teach, invest, and mobilize. And so we hope you see that today if you're a guest. And just once again, if you got one of these Connect cards, you can hand it to me or put it in the offering basket here at the end of the service. Uh, I only have one announcement, really. Uh, we won't be having grace groups the next two weeks due to the rodeo and due to fall break. Uh, and so hope you enjoy that time of service and rest. Uh, for those of y'all who are going to be serving at the rodeo, you need to be there at 4 o'clock. Um, for those 3 to 4.30, you need to be there at 4.30 on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday if you're serving there. Uh, I think there's still one spot left for Saturday. Somebody may have taken it. Uh, but thank you all for being the church outside the walls as well as inside the walls. Both of those things are crucial uh, to glorifying the Lord Jesus. And so thank you for being a church that not only is about preaching the gospel and living it out here in our gathering, but is about doing it throughout the week as well, uh, Monday through Saturday. And so with that being said, if you don't mind standing with me as we read God's word together as Ms. Shermu comes forward this morning. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord.
church. You can be seated one more time. Uh, it is our time of the service when we have the opportunity to worship the Lord through our giving. Um, and you hear it often. We say we want to be a, a sending church. It's our desire to be a sending church. And uh, when you send folks, it's, you get the privilege of, of uh, every once in a while receiving them back. And so, Grace Church, welcome Ernest Bingham back to home here at Grace Church, brother. We're glad to have you back. Ernest has spent the last couple of weeks um, on the mission field in Uganda serving with Ira and Susan Galloway. It was a tough trip, but we're going to be praying that God uses uh, your efforts greatly and blesses what you did there for the kingdom. So thank you for going. Um, last week, we talked in Philippians chapter 4, verse 17, about how Paul says, I don't seek your gift when we're talking about giving. I don't seek your gift. What I seek is the profit that your gift increases in your account, meaning when you give with the right heart to the Lord, you're putting, you're storing up your treasures in heaven. You're putting it in the bank of heaven. And that is a bank that, uh, account, a retirement plan, a 401k that always increases, that never loses. And there's never a downtime. Uh, as long as Jesus is still in office and on his throne, that account will always grow with interest. And so you can't go wrong by storing up your treasures in heaven. That was verse 17. Verse 18, let me read that to you today. Verse 18 says, but I have received everything in full and have an abundance. I am amply supplied, having received from Aphrodite what you have sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. Y'all, when we give, the reason why we say it's an opportunity to worship the Lord. You hear what Paul said? It's a fragrant aroma when you give with the right heart to the Lord. Like the, the woman who brings her alabaster jar and breaks it and just anoints Jesus with it and the, and the smell of that perfume fills the room. That's what your gift is like when you worship the Lord through giving. It's an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. Let's worship him. Uh, Alyssa, will you come and pray for our offering this morning? All right, let's pray. <clears throat> God, I thank you for who you are, and I thank you that you are worthy of the worship um, of us and God of every tribe, tongue, and nation. And so, God, I thank you that you, um, even though you don't need us, God, that you include us in this mission um, to preach your word, um, and God, that there's a guarantee that you will bring people to yourself. So God, I pray that um, we would give with the right heart and that we would know that um, ultimately our gift is to you um, and that you will take that and do with, what, do with it what you please. God, we love you and we thank you for who you are. It's your name that I pray. Amen.
Father, we love you. God, we're so thankful to be here today. Um, Lord, thank you for the forgiveness of sins. Lord, uh, the penalty so severe that your son had to die on the cross, Lord, to make atonement for it. Uh, open our ears to hear what Dane has to say, Lord, and uh, let's just apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, it's good to be with you this morning again to worship our Lord together. Thank you, Praise Band. They do such a wonderful job. I know Jack, our fearless leader up here, he's out bringing electricity back to some of those in Florida this morning. So we want to be praying for him and praying for all of our linemen as they are out doing that. So... You know, it's been a pretty uneventful week, hasn't it? I mean, not a whole lot's been going on. I mean, been kind of boring around here. Yeah. Uh, You know where we are this morning. We're in the first chapter of the book of James. And while you are turning there, um, I just want to say thank you for all of the calls. The, The food, Cheryl is doing well. Her little procedure she had on Monday. She sends her love this morning. Wish she could be here with us. Um, and just thank you for this church family for walking through this time with us together. Now, you may hear it my voice a little bit. I wanted to, if you didn't know, I just wanted to let you know that the Braves won last night. (laughs) And that's probably why my voice is cracking because I was rooting for the Braves last night. Um, There was nothing else going on. No, in in all honesty, I was over at my brother Caleb's house and Savannah's house, and I was telling him, and I showed him the little cartoon after the game last night, and I don't know, those of you that are old enough, like me, to remember the Looney Tunes, which was the greatest cartoons, uh, there was nothing politically correct about them, uh, which made them even better, but I remember Sam the Sheepdog versus Ralph the Wolf. And here's, here's the story. They would walk with their lunch pails together, the sheepdog and the wolf, and they were the best of buds, and they would just walk and they would clock in. Ralph, hope you have a good day. Sam, I hope you have a good day too. And they clock in, and then Sam goes and gets in his position, and Ralph goes and gets in his position. All of a sudden, the, the whistle goes off, almost like you hear at the factory, and all of a sudden, they become starch enemies. And from 7 o'clock in the morning until 5 o'clock in the afternoon, their whole job is to try to kill each other. And then all of a sudden, it can be right in the middle of Sam the sheepdog trying to kill Ralph the wolf. The horn goes off, and all of a sudden, Sam just drops him, and they walk back over, and they clock out. Ralph, hope you had a good day. I did too. I'll see you tomorrow, Sam. And so I think that is the the, perfect picture of football in the South We can love each other on Saturday. During the game, we can absolutely try to kill each other, and then we can come back in here and we can worship worship, uh, Jesus together. So, Sam the Sheepdog, Ralph the Wolf, YouTube it this afternoon if you've never seen it. It's worth the watch. I remember a time when I would attend AA meetings with my oldest son, Elijah, and... um, I loved the the reality of it all. Now, there was not not everything about it I loved. But here's, I I loved most of it. They didn't play around. That's what I remember. They they couldn't afford to play around. There There was no stained glass masquerade, as Casting Crown's famous song says. There was no, how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing just fine. No, I'm struggling with this, and I need you to know about it because their very life depended on it. And I remember just loving, just, I I was thinking, you know, church should be maybe just a little bit closer to that sometimes. I think that we would do good this morning to own up to the fact that without Christ, I'm bent towards sin. 
Like, hello, my name is Dane, and I'm a sinner. Now, I'm not making fun of whatever, but that's reality this morning. I am bent towards sin without Christ. And even with Christ, I live in a fallen world where sin is all around me. And we need to acknowledge that. And the first thing that we can understand, first thing that we can do is to understand who we are. Because once we do that, then we can see ourselves in relation to God. This is what James does back in verse 1. And, uh, you know, if any of you have aspirations to become God one day, I'm saying this tongue in cheek, of course, but if any of you have aspirations to become God, if you can convince your sibling that you are God, then you are well on the way. Because that is what James, the half-brother of Jesus, does here when he says, James, a bondservant of God. He understood who he was. And I don't want to spend too much time on our past this morning, but I do want to remind us that before there was the good news of the gospel, there was bad news for each and every one of us. And sometimes we forget that. In order to have good news, there must have been bad news. And oftentimes we forget that part of our story and while I don't want to stay there, I do want us to remember that that is the place that we came from. And so this morning, I want to spend our time on this subject, sin from start to finish. Sin from start to finish. I'll be reading out of the NASB, James chapter 1, starting in verse number 13, and I will read down through verse number 18. The word of the Lord says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. And in verse 18, in the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth so that we might, so that we would be a kind of first fruits among his creatures. Pray with me this morning. Our dear gracious heavenly father, as you calm the things that are going around us this morning in our lives. Father, I pray that we would not worry about the person on our left or the person on our right. But God, that we would lean into your word because you tell us that your word is truth. You tell us that the flowers fade and the grass withers and fall, but your word remains forever. So feed us with your truth this morning. And as your servant John the Baptist said, Father, I pray that every one of us in here would decrease so that you might increase. For it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Sin from start to finish. If you remember back a couple of weeks when Dr. John was preaching he covered in verse 2 where, where the Bible says that we are to consider it all joy when we encounter trials in our life. And I want us to see this morning that there is an important link between that verse and the verses that we are reading this morning. It's interesting that James uses the same Greek word, parasimos. And again, I'm not some Greek scholar, right? But I know how to use a, 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 a concordance. 
And there's, a, there's this link of parasimos, which can mean, can be translated either trial or temptation. And so we see this word parasimos back in verse 2 that Dr. John preached on, but then we see it again here this morning in verse 13. For example, James says back in verse 2 when he says various trials, he's saying various parasimos. And it's the same word for temptation, just depends on the context of, uh, of what the author is trying to convey. And so this serves to remind us that all trials have in them this element of temptation, and all temptation has in them an element of trial. It's important to note that even though they are identified with each other, they're not identical with each other, to each other. This trial is a matter of when and not if, and it's the main highway. And if I had the board up here this morning, I would kind of show it. I'd kind of draw it. But if you could just imagine a main highway that's called trial, right? And, 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 and there's two branches that go off of this main highway. There's one branch that goes to the right, and I think we could call that branch perseverance, you know, it's like what Yogi Berra says, when you come to a fork in the road, pick it up, right? But what we need to be careful of is to what fork we pick up, because there's two forks here. There's a fork of perseverance, and there's the fork of temptation. When we take this fork of perseverance, we're left with a... a, 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 a we're left with this, as Dr. John covered in verse 2. Perseverance leads to endurance. Perseverance leads to perfection. Let me read it for us again. Consider it all joy, my brother, when we encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of our faith produces endurance. And endurance having its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, and it produces us lacking nothing. Verse number four. That's the, the fork of that's the fork of perseverance this morning. And then ultimately, as Brother Cliff talked about last week, last week in verse 12, it ultimately leads to the crown of life. Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial, for once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life. And that's the fork of perseverance. But if we're not careful... The testing on the outside may become temptation on the inside, leading us to uh, turn our back on God and going our own way or taking the other fork. This sin gives birth to death. Now, that's an interesting phrase, and the King James Version uses that. What I read this morning in, in, in verse number 15, it, once sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. The, I'm sorry, not the King James, but the NIV says that uh, uh, sin brings a birth death. Now, when we think about birth, we don't think about death. And it's this juxtaposition of these two words that's interesting because birth brings forth life. But what the Bible is saying this morning is that sin births death. When our circumstances are difficult, we may find ourselves complaining against God, questioning his love, resisting his will for our life. And it's at that point that Satan provides us with an opportunity to escape the difficulty that is set before us. Maybe it's an opportunity to run from it. I've done that. Maybe it's an opportunity to numb it. I've done that too. I don't want to have to deal with this today. I'll deal with it tomorrow. The problem is tomorrow hardly ever comes. 
Maybe it's an opportunity to follow our heart because after all, we all deserve to be happy. And this opportunity is a temptation and when we succumb to it, it leads to failure. It leads to fleeting satisfaction in our life. And ultimately, as Cher read this morning in Romans 6.23, it ultimately leads to death. Because sin, once it's accomplished, it births death. And so with that in mind, we need to remind ourselves daily that there is a definite reality to you and to me. Look again at verse 13 and 14 and read it with me again. The Bible says, I'm going to read down through 15. It says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. And there's a definite reality in here this morning. It's interesting that James uses the word when in his opening thought. Let no man say when he is tempted. Now, it would be a lot easier if James had used the word if right there. But that's not what he says. He says when. None of us get to escape this. It's not reality for James to use if because temptation and sin, they are linked together. Romans 3.23 says, for all have sin. Now, all means all. We know they're linked together because God cannot be tempted by evil. Verse 13. He cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone, but each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. And this is the reality of the situation. But the problem lies in that we don't believe reality. We don't believe it. And so we move from a definite reality to what I would call a utopian reality. A reality where you know where everybody everybody gets along. Everybody gets a trophy. Where no animals are harmed. Where no children are harmed. Where no women are harmed. Take away the guns because that'll fix everything. Legalize this and legislate that because we can legislate morality. And I'm here to tell you this morning in Greek that that is a bunch of hogwash. We can't. There's a definite reality this morning, and we tend to, to live in a utopian reality. I remember a couple of years ago when Cheryl and I were traveling to the Far East. I hesitate to even use the country that we went to. But, I, but we were going there because we were working trying to help young girls escape sex trafficking. And by young girls, let me define it, 10, 11, and 12-year-olds. That same week that we flew out of Atlanta uh, uh, to go was the same week that this feminist group marched on Washington about feminist rights. Now, I don't want you to throw rocks at me, but for the love of God, can we put down our signs and, and go and march in these brothels where 10, 11, and 12 year olds are being sold to the highest bidder? That's reality. That's our reality. That's what's going on in our world. And that's the utopia that you and I 
can create. Reality is we can't sit back and watch the world we live in pass by even though we try. We are commanded to go and more than that we have the opportunity to go. In fact, I love what Spurgeon says when he says Christians are not so much in danger when they are persecuted as when they are admired. Here is the reality in our churches in America. We are in danger because we are admired. Don't tell me I'm a good preacher because I love to hear it. I'm telling you that this morning. I love to hear it. Don't tell me I'm a good missionary because I eat that stuff up. The reality is that I'm one hungry sinner trying to tell another hungry sinner where the bread of life is. And there's a definite reality in the world and that is that the depravity of man ends in chaos and ultimately in hell. Which leads to my second point of defective reasoning. Verse 13, the Bible says again, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. So baked into everything that James has written has been this absolute truth of God's providence over our lives, over everything around us. Look back at verse 2 with me again where we see that God in his sovereign will uses trials to perfect us. But we take this test and if we aren't careful, we will consummate our will with the harlot called lust and it gives birth to death. Then we have the prideful gall to blame God for all that's going wrong in our life. Nothing's ever our fault. It's not my fault that I act this way. It's defective reasoning. Don't blame me. I'm a product of my environment. Don't blame me. I'm a victim. You remember Adam and Eve when, when in the garden when Jesus or God came to Adam in the cool of the day and he says, Adam, where are you? And Adam hid himself. Why, how do you know that you're naked? Well, we, we ate the fruit and all that. Who told, you, who told you that? Well, it was that woman you gave me. So God goes to the woman. What have you done, woman? Well, it was the serpent. And we never own up to the fact that we are sinful. It's always someone else's problem. But listen, listen to me, church. God's person can never be defiled. His purpose can never be deflected. His perception can never be dulled. His power can never be diminished. And his promises can never be devalued. Not only is there a definite reality along with a defective reasoning, but the third thing is that there is decisive responsibility. Look back at verses 14, 15 with me. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. So once we consider the condition of the heart being deceitful above all, Jeremiah 17.9 tells us that, then we can begin to understand and recognize man's depravity, his total depravity, and this decisive, the decisive responsibility of it all lying squarely on you and on me. Look at this phrase. Uh, uh, if you underline in your Bible, if you mark in your Bible, it would be good to underline this. His own lust. Or maybe yours says, if you, if you have another version, his own evil desire. James immediately identifies where the responsibility lies. We can try and manipulate this verse to say something other than it does, but we would only be lying to ourselves this morning. 
And the irony, of, the irony of trying to alter what the Bible says kind of proves the verse in and of itself. We don't want it to say that. But it says that. And we've already discussed how Adam answered God back in the garden. It was that woman that you gave me. And man has a wicked condition which leads to his responsibility. But also we must consider all the traps that are laid before us. So knowing that a man has a condition, a condition that we call sin, there needs to be a consideration. There needs to be consideration of the phrase just before his own lust where, where the Bible says, and it carried away and enticed. Now this phrase is caught up in one word in the Greek, and it's the word excel kominos. And I'm not smart enough to know this, but the commentary told me that this is a hypox leguminon, and I thought I'd never get there, Brother John, but that's what we got this morning is a hypox leguminon which means that this is used once in the New Testament, this word. And, when, and, and I've learned that where we can find nuance, we can always find nutrition. And so if we can find a word that, 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 that is only used once, we need to pay attention to it, pay close attention to it. And this word, excel kominos, it means to be dragged away. To be dragged away. And it carries the idea of an animal being lured from a place of safety to a place where it can be attacked or trapped. Any of us that have hunted, all of us have done that. Whether it be covering our scent or giving it something to eat or camouflaging ourselves, We're laying traps before it. This word enticed, it pictures a big old fish being tricked by a sparkling fish lure. You know, we try to make those things look as sparkly and as pretty as we possibly can because we want to dangle them right in front of the mouth of that fish because we're wanting to entrap him. We're wanting to trick him. And that's what the word enticed means. The fish bites down on it only to find the concealed deadly hook. And inwardly, man has the desire and the potential to sin. And outwardly, there are sparkling lures everywhere. I mean, it's on our billboards as we ride down the interstates. We bear all. It's on our commercials when we watch it on TV. Just do this and you will never do this again. Just eat this. Just put this on. Just do this. Sparkling lures in front of us all the time. It's on our phones. Nobody will ever know. We can hide it. Man, it looks pretty. It's in the clothes that we wear. Are we a target or are we a treasure? It's in the shows that we watch. And as long as we resist these, then we're safe. But it's this consideration that gives birth to action, which ultimately gives birth to death. And so a consideration of the condition of man leads to a guilty union or conception. And this conception is committed by the condition of man consummating his will and embracing the desires of the flesh or what the Bible calls lust. You know that lust by itself can give birth to nothing? But it's only when the harlot lust is consummated with the will of the man that death is born.
It's often been said that the definition of a person is that small gap of time between a thought and an action. Within that time, we will either say yes or we'll say no to ungodly desires. And listen to me this morning, church. There's not anything wrong with desires. They're of God. There's nothing wrong with sexual desires. There's nothing wrong with hunger desires. There's nothing wrong with those things. Without sexual desires, we wouldn't procreate. Without hunger desires, we wouldn't eat. But the problem is when those desires get outside the will of God in our lives, that is that sex outside of marriage leads to adultery or fornication. Gluttony leads to unhealthy living or, 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 or workaholics leading to the abandonment of your family. Or you name it this morning. What's your desire? And is it in the boundaries that God has laid before you in your life. So lust, the harlot, gives birth to sin. Then sin, when it is completed, gives birth to death, which it, which, which it was all along pregnant with. Now, it took me a while to find one of these, but this is what I picture, and this is, some of you may recognize this as one of those Russian, Russian nesting dolls. This is kind of what I picture this morning. And I think this is what it's trying to say. That when lust is consummated with the evil desires of man, it gives birth to sin, which was all alone pregnant with death. Death is nested inside sin. They're not mutually exclusive. They go together. For the wages of sin is death. Verse 16 and verse 17. One more thing before I get there. This death that I'm speaking about this morning, it stands in striking contrast to the crown of life that Brother Cliff preached on last week. This crown of life which patience and endurance Ends with, ends with when it's perfect work. James 1, verse 4. So those are our two forks. Now, verse 16. And I'm going to use verses 16 and 17 as kind of a bridge for the sake of time this morning. Because praise the Lord, we have baptisms. But verse 16, the Bible says, Do not be deceived my beloved brethren. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of life, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. So I'd like to use these two verses to take us from a place of no, of hopelessness, because I've been pretty negative so far. But that's the reality of life without Jesus. It's no hope. Sin rules. And so I want to take us from a place of hopelessness to a place uh, to, to the hope giver. Verse 15 ends with sin giving birth to death, but verse 18 begins with God in the exercise of his will giving birth to life. He is the heavenly giver, verse 17 tells us. If you think about human giving, it, it may or may not be sincere. It may not be sensible. It may not be sufficient. It may not be suitable. But if you think about heaven's gift, the gifts that we're talking about this morning, his works are perfect. His way is perfect. His will is perfect. And his word is perfect this morning. And so... Using those verses as the bridge, let's quickly jump to verse 18 and get to the good side of this sermon. The Bible says, In the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, so that we would be a kind of first fruits among 
his creature. One of my favorite chapters in all the Bible, and you might want to, it'd probably do you good if you're still with me to turn over to Ephesians 2. It's one of my favorite chapters. And I never get tired of rereading it. It always reminds me of who I was and who I am now. James has this same attitude as Dr. John pointed out a couple of weeks ago back when he considered himself as a bondservant. He considered himself as lowly, as nothing. It is, it is with this attitude that we can start to get at what James is saying. And I want you to notice the contrast here in Ephesians chapter 2 between the state of the unbeliever and the state of the believer. The whole chapter of Ephesians 2 develops these two thoughts. Look with me down in verse number 12. It says, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenant of the promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So before Jesus, at that time, as the Bible says it, we were separate from Christ. We were excluded from citizenship. We were foreigners Verse 13 says that we were far away. Verse 16 said that we had hostility toward God. But then the Bible says in verse number 13, but now in Christ. I'm just a beat up old bulldog this morning. Y'all going to have to help me a little bit. (laughs) But now in Christ. I mean, there was hopelessness. But now in Christ. So, so with Christ, we are in Christ, verse 13, as opposed to separate from Christ. We were not excluded from citizenship, but we're fellow citizens with God's people, verse 19. We're members of God's household, verse 19. We're brought near, verse 13, where we were far away. And then in verse 17, there is peace uh, as related to hostility. With Christ changes everything. However, the most bizarre contrast that Paul makes in that chapter is when he starts out with the really bad news. Verse number one, I won't read it for the sake of time, but it basically says this, that we were spiritually dead. We were bent towards sin and away from God. We were enemies of God and under his wrath. But then, in my opinion, the greatest verse in all the Bible, verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead and our transgressions made us alive. Paul doesn't say that we have been spiritually improved. He doesn't say that we have been morally strengthened. He doesn't say that we've been given a new direction. Uh, Or or some like to say that God has fanned the flames of goodness that already exists within me. There is no good in me apart from Jesus Christ. You can fan all you want, but all you got is a fan. Paul is stating that what has happened to us is nothing short of a miracle. We were made alive when we were dead. The Savior has given birth to life. He has taken that which was spiritually dead and he's made it alive in himself. Anything less than a miracle is less than a biblical appreciation of what God has done for us and bringing us to himself. And what's even more is that it highlights the fact that our, of our total inability to bring ourselves to God. No amount of religion, no amount of sincerity, no amount of church going or generosity or works can bridge the eternal gap between man and God. John says, uh, uh, Jesus says in John 6, 37, all that the Father gives me comes to me. And now in this verse before us, James, back in James chapter 1, verse 18, he tells us three 
things about this miracle. God's greatest gift to man. James says that he brought us forth. God's greatest gift to man is that the infinity of the new birth to those who believe on him. Verse 18, it says, In the exercise of his will, he brought us forth. One version says that he chose us. The word, this word infinite that I'm using, it carries a, a value with it that describes the cost of this gift. In math terms, me being an engineer, whenever we use the word infinity, it means we can't describe it. It's undescribable. It cannot be contained in terms of earth or in terms of time or of space, but belongs in a place that none of those can describe. It existed before time. That's where infinity was. It existed before earth. It existed before space. And so a logical question this morning is, why did God create the world? Why did he create man? Why did he create anything? And so, and so most of the time when we start off a question with, why did God, it normally ends in, Absurdity. The Bible actually gives us the answers to those questions. And it comes from the mouths of the celestial elders as they're gathered around the throne of God in Revelation chapter 4 where they are, are crying, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and because of your will they existed and were created. Revelation chapter 4 verse number 11. The simple reason the Bible gives for the existence of everything in all creation is that it came into being by God's will because he chose that it should happen. For the unbeliever, no other explanation is possible this morning. And for the believer, no other explanation is necessary this morning. And so logic tells us that God doesn't have a thought because you can't know everything and then all of a sudden think of something. I mean, as the old preacher man said, has it ever occurred to you that nothing has ever occurred to God? It just doesn't happen. He knows it all. He can't know everything and then something come to his mind. And so with this in mind, we understand that this initiative, this impulse all comes from God and is affected by nothing outside of the character of who God is. That is why I'm saying that the new birth is infinite in its being. That is, it is wholly rooted in God. Now, I know that I, I don't earn my salvation, but without getting too involved in the deep and murky waters of theology, doesn't the Bible speak about God's foreknowledge in Ephesians chapter 1? Before the foundations of the world were created, he knew his foreknowledge. Now, I don't know what all of that means, and, and I'm here to tell you this morning that if anyone tells you that they do know what all that means, you need to run. But I do know what it doesn't mean. I know that the creator can never be placed in the hands of the created. God's purpose to save men is never suspended in the will of man.
Because that would make grace dependent upon the will of man. And once grace becomes dependent upon anything, it ceases to be grace at that point because grace is free and it's unmerited favor. And God's gift is infinite in its being. But not only that, but also it is infinite in its beginning. That may sound a little contradictory in one sense, but hang with me for a second. When we speak of a physical birth, we see it as a, a moment in time and we memorialize it and we celebrate it every year. But we tend to use the same kind of language when we, when we start to think about our spiritual birthday. So-and-so gave their life to Christ on such-and-such such a date. For me, it was June 10th, 1979. I remember the date like it was yesterday. But the problem is that if our thinking ends there, then we stop a long way short of the whole truth. This new birth necessarily takes place in a moment in time, but it is set in motion before time began. It is infinite in its beginning because its beginning lies in infinity past. Think about what the prophet Jeremiah said when he said in Jeremiah 1.5, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I set you apart. Paul further illustrates this over in Ephesians 1.4 that we just read, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. So these two examples alone show us that the genesis of our regeneration is within the eternal will of God before time began and existed. Not only is it infinite in its being and infinite in its beginning, but finally it's infinite in its blessing. Camouflaged and so easily glazed over is this vital aspect of truth revealed within God's will to secure us to himself. Aren't you glad this morning that we are in the hands of God and that he is not in our hands? A lot of Christians still wrestle with the question that goes something like this. Is it possible for me at any time to fall away so badly that I will be rejected by God and eternally lost? Now, the, if the answer to that question is yes, then the cause of us to fall away is obviously sin. But if sin causes a believer to be unsaved, then no believer is ever saved because we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So the argument is reduced to absurdity. The truth of the matter lies along an entirely different line. The Christian's eternal salvation depends not upon man, thank God, but it depends upon man, upon God's choice of man. I'm reminded of when Jesus wept at the tomb of his dear friend Lazarus. He hated it. I always wonder, well, why didn't you just, why'd you cry? Why, why didn't you just, and then he did. He made him alive. But he, he hated the sin. And sin is a terrible disease that each of us was born with. Romans 5.12 tells us that. That all of us inherited sin from Adam. But I thank God that when Jesus, the eternal Son of God, resurrected on the third day, that he defeated sin. That he defeated death. And he said, it is finished. And the Savior gives birth to life. You know, it kind of reminds me of the, I love the Rocky movies. Grew up in the 80s, born in the 70s, grew up in the 80s. Probably one of my favorite ones is when Rocky got too old to fight and he had a 
young man that was kind of his up under him named Tommy Gunn. And Tommy Gunn got this other guy that got in his head and was all about money and and so this street fight between Tommy Gunn and Rocky ensued. I don't know if you remember the movie or not. Go watch that one too this afternoon, right after Sam the Sheepdog and Ralph the Wolf. But Tommy was beating the brakes off of Rocky until Tommy brought Rocky's family into the fight. And you know how it ends. Tommy was walking away and Rocky could barely get to his feet. And that old Philadelphia voice, hey, Tommy, how about one more round? Because Tommy had talked about Rocky's life. And so it makes me think about Satan thought that he had won. He thought that it was over, but can't you just see Jesus standing to his face, to his feet and telling Satan, hey, Satan, how about one more round? And he resurrected on the third day. And he walked out of the tomb. And Jesus defeated sin, and thank God he holds us in the palm of his hand. He is our propitiation, our acceptable sacrifice this morning. He is uh, our righteousness. He is our Jehovah Jireh, our provider this morning. He is the great physician. He is the true vine this morning. He is the living water. He is the bread of life. He is the uh, mercy. He is the balm of Gilead. He is the rose of Sharon this morning. He is the perfect giver this morning. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the great I Am. He is the, the, the beginning and the end. He is the great High Priest. He is the Rock of Ages this morning. He is timeless. He is powerful. He is all-knowing. He's unchangeable. He's perfect. And He's the Son of God. He's the Lamb of God. And when he said as it is finished, he kicked the teeth out of sin, death, and the grave. And we can celebrate that this morning. And it doesn't matter who won yesterday. I'm reminded of that old hymn, me and Colton, sorry, me and, me and um, Caleb sang it a little bit yesterday in Savannah. There is a fountain filled with blood flown from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Pray with me. Our dear gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your, thank you that you chose us, Father. God, I pray that we would be reminded of where we came from so that we will never forget of who we are in relation to you. You are God. We are your bondservants to be used by you to glorify your name with our life. We're not of our own. We've been bought with a price. You paid an infinite price for me to be able to stand and draw my next breath, God. And I pray that we never take it for granted. God, that we would be intentional about telling a lost and dying world about the only hope that exists, and that is you, Jesus Christ. God, we were hopeless, but you give us hope. We were spiritually dead, but you brought us to life. We were bent away from you, but you came to us because we couldn't go to you. We were your enemy, but you have brought us close by the blood of your Son. 
who died on the cross. Now, Father, you tell us in your word, Jesus says that I am the way, the truth, and the life, and I believe that this morning. But he says that no man can come to you except through him. So, Father, I'm praying for that person that's in here this morning that maybe doesn't know you. God, there is no other way. Sometimes if I'm honest, God, I wish I try to create another way or I want there to be another way. But there is no other way except for through the cross, through Jesus and through his blood and what he did on Calvary's cross. And I thank you for that this morning, Father. So, Father, I pray that you draw as only you can. And, Father, I pray that in our obedience that we obey what you are dealing with us on the individual Father, I thank you for those that have accepted you that we would not forget where we came from, but that we would live a life knowing that you provide it all, and that we would be intentional, Father. Of course, in the name of Jesus that we pray, amen. If you would stand to your feet, if God is doing business with you this morning, we're not going to tarry long because he's either doing business or he's not. If he's doing business with you, Brother Colin will be up here, Brother John will be up here, Brother Jerry's up here, Caleb's up here, uh, uh, Alyssa's up here, Jamie's up here, Sharon's up here, Jamie's up here, Brother Cliff's up here. Come do business with Jesus this morning. Don't tarry.
are today, we uh, come to baptize a, a group, and uh, we're going to separate this group into two, two parts, and it'll make a little more sense to you in a second, but uh, I want to invite Joey to come forth, and uh, you know, when you can come around here. One of, the, one of the cool things about doing our little Grace uh, Church membership meetings is we get to hear personally everybody's testimony and how they came to know Christ. And, you know, some are very confident in their situation of their baptism, and some are not. And Joey came to know the Lord and was never scripturally baptized. And I remember asking him specifically, and it was like he recognized it at the first time. First, and he, he just said, well, man, I need, to, I need to get that, I need to get that right. And I admire you for that courage, because it takes, a, it's a lot easier to be on that side than it is on this side. And one of the joys of when we go to Africa is people come from all over. And you can sit down for just a second, by the way. Because I'm going to ask you to stand up in a minute. <laughs> so, Joey, jump on in here in this trough. Yeah, it's cold. Yeah, it's cold. Like ice in there on me. But one of the cool things about this is Joey's got some friends and some of you that are in his grace group. And support is a cool thing. So if you're a part of Joey's grace group, you know him. You, you, you understand his walk of where he is, if you wouldn't just mind standing in support and let these people see. Look out there at all these people that are proud of you. So, Joey, you, you can grab my hand. Okay. I'm as uncomfortable as you are. <laughs> Do you know that you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes. So, based on that, Based on that promise, not anything you've done, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Raised to walk in newness of life. And look, we didn't even break his wrist. You just have to know that. Yeah, it's supposed to happen Easter until John broke my wrist on me. <laughs> So Lynn and Sandra, if you'll come on over. This is uh, Lynn and Sandra. And you know, yeah, come on. <laughs> you know, the, one of the cool things about this is this is a couple. This is husband and wife. And why this is extra special for Cliff is when I was baptized, my daughter and I were baptized at the same time. So we're going to let ladies go first. And we're going to all help you get in here. We're not going to make a scene right here in church. And she's been waiting on her leg to heal. And Sandra was one of those that her baptism was out of order as well. And today you're getting that all straight. Aren't you glad? And so do you know that you know you've asked Jesus to come into your heart and save you? Yes. So, Sandra, based on that, let me hold that other hand. I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hey, I, for, I forgot one thing. If you know Sandra out there, you're part of her grace group, Stand in support of her. <laughs> so, Lynn, hop on in here. Now, Lynn is a little different, and these are out here standing in support of you. Lynn is a little different. One Sunday after church, not too long ago, 
Dr. Allen and John had the privilege to lead you to the Lord. And you made your profession of faith that Sunday, did you not? Yes. So hold my hand, and based on that, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to John. All right. We got two more. I'm going to ask Miss Andrea Ramsey to come stand up here with me. Let me have that. Can you hold that for her? Come right here. This is Miss Andrea. Uh, Miss Andrea went to student life camp this summer and made a profession of faith at, at camp. Uh, came back, and um, I appreciate her witness because it, it, it sparked a conversation at my house because my kids, she was telling everybody she got saved at camp. And my kids came and asked me and Sarah, it didn't quite make sense. I thought she was saved. What do you mean she got saved? And, and Andrea said, I know that I am saved now. Uh, something happened to her at camp. Well, her daddy Trey and her mom Megan wanted to wait on her baptism and until they started they started watching her life and just saw a change in her and um, just her attitude just changed towards her siblings um, just uh, her love for the word and so her dad called me this week and just said I think we're going to let her get baptized we want to let her get baptized uh, we are seeing that she has been changed and so uh, Miss Andrew I'm going to ask you to, to sit in there all right. Yeah, Andrea, do you? Let me ask you two questions first. Uh, do you believe that Jesus has done everything necessary to save you from your sins? Yes. Are you willing to follow Him wherever He leads you to go? Yes. It is my privilege and honor, based on your profession of faith and obedience to His command to be baptized. Uh, to baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right. Miss Kate, can you stand up here by me? And our last one, this is Kate. This is my daughter. This is uh, a big day for, for me. Um, this is a, a lot of prayer has been going into this day. Uh, Kate's been asking to do this for a long time. And uh, me and Sarah have put her off. Uh, we want to make sure she understood the gospel, uh, what it meant to follow Jesus. And, you know, if I'm honest, I struggled with my salvation as a young teenager. And I don't want my kids to struggle. I want them to know that they know that they know Christ. And uh, so, uh, you know, Jesus, Jesus said, uh, don't keep the little children from coming to me. Don't hinder them because the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. And uh, a couple weeks ago, she came into the living room and said, Daddy, um, I want to be saved. I want to follow Christ. And so we were, me and Sarah were able to just talk with her share the gospel again and just pray there in our living room. I asked her to go talk to Cliff and Dane because I'm too close to the situation. I wanted them to, to uh, interrogate her as well. And, uh, um, and so she, she comes before her church family today to just um, publicly declare that she wants to follow Jesus. So, Kate, will you sit in here? I'm going to ask you two questions, Okay. Kate, do you believe that Jesus has done everything necessary to save you from your sins? Yes. Are you willing to follow him wherever he leads you to go? Yes. Okay, on behalf of your profession of faith in Christ and in obedience to his command, it is my honor to baptize you, my sister, in Christ, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.
Okay, we're not done yet. I'm going to ask Lynn and Miss Sandra to come up here. <coughs> uh, Mr. Lynn and Miss Sandra went through our new members class, and um, we thought, hey, what a good day to present them as new members to the church when they get baptized. Um, and so uh, you've heard already their testimonies of how Lynn came to know the Christ recently, uh, this past year, just starting to grow, be around other godly men of this church. And I just thank you all so much for coming alongside him to uh, uh, disciple him. He wants to be like a Jerry Newman and a Michael Madden and a Robin Carroll. He just uh, wants to be able to grow in his knowledge of the Bible and do what you guys do there. Um, and just to hear Miss Sandra and how the last few years the Lord has just changed her. And, um, and so it's my honor to bring them to you this morning to affirm them as members here at Grace Church. If you are uh, in favor of having them come join us here at Grace Church as members, would you say amen? amen. Um, as a, before we close, uh, I want to pray first off and just thank God for his goodness. We have a gift from Miss Deborah. Um, uh, to, to Lynn and Sandra from the church. It's from the church, but Miss Deborah does this because uh, she's just a blessing. Um, and so that's just a, a, a welcome aboard gift. And, uh, and now we've got to put you to work. Um, but you notice that the, the sermon today, you caught it. It says that the Lord brought us forth, he brought us to life by the what? The word of truth. You wonder why Grace Church wants to focus on the word of God. Because that's what brings people to life. It's through the word of God. And so Grace Church, as we go out these doors, when we're around people at the rodeo this week, God saves people through the word of truth. And he brings them to life. And so getting them, that's why we want to get our children under the preaching of God's word. Um, from an early age, it's why we want uh, to focus on, on and grace groups application that comes from the word of truth because that's what brings people to life. And so, uh, what? Thank God, who was the first person that ever taught you how do you become a Christian? It was through hearing the word of God, the gospel. That's how it happened. And so, hey, let's pray and let's thank God for his blessings, his infinite blessings that he has given us, okay? Uh, Father God, Lord, we come before you today to just celebrate what you have done. You are still in the business of bringing people who are spiritually dead and bringing them to life. And so we praise you, God. We give you um, all the glory. We thank you for your, your grace and your mercy that you've demonstrated to us today. Uh, and God, I pray for these five that we were able to baptize today, that you would hold them fast, that you would keep them from temptation from the enemy, uh, help them to persevere and make it all the way home. And God, that you would use them greatly, that they would share the word of truth with others so that others may have that same blessing that they've had to be brought to life. And God, we love you. We ask this in your whole name we pray. Amen. Amen, Grace Church. We love you. Have a wonderful Sunday. You are sent. Coming for another hug. I'm already I'm already wet. <laughs> good job, good job.